forgot. <laughs> okay. So we are recording. And I'm going to. Now you just. Hey, Jen. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start letting people in unless Susan, you have any last minute questions or anything. No, I think we're good. Okay, perfect. All right, here they come. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Bat Responses to Civil Culture Treatments webinar. Um, we're going to get started in a couple minutes. And before we do, I just want to say a couple reminders. Um, we are using the meeting format of Zoom today. So if you could please keep your microphones muted the entire time so we can give our wonderful speaker just the whole floor. That would be greatly appreciated. You can, if you want to, turn your camera on. If you want to see some faces, feel free to do so. Um, but we will have this shared screen up the whole time, um, but we do ask that you please keep your microphone muted. And we'll get started in about a minute. Hello, everybody who is just joining us, and welcome to our Bat Responses to Civil Culture Treatments webinar. We're going to get started in about a minute or so. I know a lot of y'all registered, and so I just want to give some extra time for folks to roll in and join us and get connected to audio and all that good stuff. So it is one o'clock. Hey, everybody who is now just joining us. My name is Dakota Wagner. I'm the Southeast Region Coordinator with the Forest Stewards Guild. And today I am your host for the Bat Responses to Civil Culture Treatments webinar. And I'm very excited about this webinar today. And I know a lot of you are too. We got some great responses and some great interest. Um, I'm just admitting some more folks into the webinar. So just bear with me while I do that. Okay, and as I said earlier, um, we do ask, <clears throat> excuse me, that folks please keep your microphones muted so we can give full attention to Dr. Susan Loaf, our great speaker that we have today. You are welcome to have your camera on if you want to see faces, um, but we will have this presentation shared throughout the entirety of today's webinar, so feel free to have your camera on or not. It's up to you. Um, but before we get started, I do want to paste into the chat box a couple links for y'all the first is just dr susan Loeb's profile so you can see all of her work and research and publications and then specifically um, that might be of interest in the journal of homology publication the qualitative synthesis of temperate bat responses to silviculture treatments where do you go from here and that is kind of the overall topic of today's webinar. And let me see here, any other logistical things? Oh yeah, the link to the SAS CFE credits, I will post that at the end of today's webinar. So when you see that, make sure to click on the form and fill it out so you can get credit for today. It will get one hour, so one CFE. And then if you have any questions and as you have them, please type them into the chat box. I'll be monitoring that and then at the end of Susan's presentation, I'll ask them and she will answer. <clears throat> 
So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Dr. Susan Loeb is a research ecologist and project leader of the Upland Hardwood Ecology and Management Research Unit of the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. She is located at Clemson University, where she is an adjunct professor, professor and advises graduate students. Dr. Loeb received her BA from Stanford University and MS and PhD from University of California, Davis. She has been with the Southern Research Station for over 30 years, where she has studied the impacts of southern flying squirrels on the endangered red cockaded woodpecker, as well as the ecology of ground dwelling rodents in relation to downwoody debris. For the past 20 plus years, Dr. Loeb has been studying the ecology and conservation of forest bats in the southeast. Research focuses on the responses of bats to forest management and other disturbances the effects of white nose syndrome on bat populations, and the development of monitoring techniques. So without further ado, Susan, I'm going to hand it off to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dakota and Jen, for inviting me to speak to all of you today. Um, first of all, I want to recognize uh, my co-author on this, uh, Dr. Rachel Blakey, uh, who is a postdoc at La Crete's Center for California Conservation Science. Uh, she and I have been working together to, put, um, to develop a review of bat responses to prescribed fire and wildfire, which I will talk about at the very end. Um, but before I get to that, uh, first of all, what I would like to do uh, is sort of give you a bigger perspective uh, about bats and why you should care about bats and why you should care about um, managing for bats. So first of all, talk about the importance of forests to bats, uh, and then talk about the importance of bats to forests. Then briefly touch on the status of bats, uh, and again, why you need to consider bats in your management. And then finally get into the meat of the webinar um, and talk about this review and synthesis that uh, I conducted a couple of years ago and um, is presented in far more detail in that Journal of Mammalogy uh, publication that Jen um, or Dakota mentioned and is in the link in the chat. And then finally touch on um, just a few points that we sort of highlighted in our review of bats responses to prescribed fire and wildfire. So uh, with that, first of all, why forests are important for bats. Um, the majority of the 1,450 some odd species of bat uh, that you can find worldwide rely on bats, I mean, rely on forests to some extent, uh, if not for everything uh, in terms of their life history requirements. Uh, so they use forests for roosting, they use forests for foraging, uh, for obtaining water, and for predator evasion. And this is where a lot of them conduct all of their social interactions as well. When it comes to roosting, uh, lots of times people think of bats, they think of bat caves. Uh, and a lot of bat species do roost in caves or mines or other types of structures similar to that. Um, and some bats, roost in those caves and mines year round. A number of species will use those caves and mines for the winter and then use forests uh, during the summer for the roosting. Um, other species will use forest year round for roosting. So what types of trees do they use for roosting? Uh, well, uh, snags are extremely important for a number of species. So on the left, we have um, an Indiana bat and an Indiana bat roost. Uh, so a lot of bats will use crevices in snags, cavities in snags, and like this Indiana bat and a number of other species, they will use the space between that sloughing bark and the bowl of that snag. And believe it or not, you can get 70, 100, even more bats in relatively small pieces of bark like that. 
On the right, we have a rack and mass figure bat. Uh, they use cavities primarily in large live trees. Then we have our foliage roosters. So these are bats uh, that will just use uh, bumps of leaves, oftentimes dead leaves, which camouflages them quite well. Uh, they will just hang up in that foliage. They will have their young there. Um, and um, so primarily, most bats will use hardwood trees, um, but there are some species like the hoary bat that will also use pine trees. They'll also use such structures as Spanish moss and other types of lichens um, that will um, hang from trees. For those um, bats that roost year round in trees and rely on deciduous trees, uh, in the winter they've got a problem because those, those leaves are gone. Uh, so what they will do is uh, during the winter, oftentimes they will roost in evergreen shrubs. And when it gets really cold, they will go under the leaf litter and roost and actually go into torpor under the litter. So this is particularly important when you start considering prescribed burns uh, in the winter and early spring. In terms of foraging habitat, um, many bats will use forests for foraging. Um, they are particularly the insectivorous bats and um, the frugivorous bats are all highly dependent on forests for foraging. Um, a lot of bats, as I will get into later on, uh, like more open forests, so particularly mature forests. And then also the um, edges between openings and forests are also really important foraging sites for a number of species of bats. Most bats, particularly the insectivorous bats, rely on free water for drinking. They cannot get sufficient water simply from their food. So we all know the importance of forests for providing clean water and bats rely on that clean water as well. And then protection from predators. Bats have lots of predators, owls, um, snakes, raccoons, late flying hawks, um, and forests and forest structures like cavities provide a great deal of protection from those predators. All right, so the importance of bats to forests. Uh, about 70% of bats worldwide are insectivores. Um, I put that in quotes because they also eat other types of arthropods, uh, spiders and, and other types of arthropods. But they are out there um, and they are, have high energy demands. And so they are eating hundreds of insects, um, mostly flying insects every night. A um, number of people are now trying to quantify those pest control services that they are providing. Uh, this is a nice study that was done in a cornfield, a uh, different type of agriculture. Um, but what they did was they put nets up at night and excluded bats uh, at night and then um, compared those cornfields where bats were excluded to cornfields where they were not. The major pest on corn, uh, at least in the Midwest, is the corn borer. And so what you can see in these graphs is that in those corn fields where bats were excluded, uh, there are higher number of these corn borer larvae per plant. Um, there is higher amount of damage per ear of corn where bats are excluded. Uh, there's more of this fungus where, uh, which actually causes uh, the damage to the corn and there's more leaf damage. So bats are definitely controlling some of these corn borers uh, in these fields. Uh, bringing it more to a forest situation, again, they excluded bats and birds uh, from some, uh, in a forest restoration project in the tropics. And what you can see is in those areas where there are bats uh, and birds um, present uh, or just bats alone, there are, is much less uh, leaf damage due to insect herbivory 
than when there are no predators. Um, also in the tropics and subtropics, bats are very important for sea dispersal. And in a number of um, countries, uh, they're very important for sea dispersal of important economic crops. Also in terms of pollination, um, they are pollinating uh, a lot of some important uh, economic crops as well as um, other types of trees and plants. Uh, this is a study where they use camera traps. And um, so to see who was coming to pollinate uh, the flowers of this tree. And what I want you to focus in, in on is uh, the letters where it says NP. Uh, those are the nocturnal pollinators, i.e. bats. And so when you have bats pollinating these, uh, this tree, you have significantly greater seed set than um, some of the daytime pollinators um, like birds or diurnal insects. And also in terms of nutrient cycling. Um, so bats are out there, they're feeding on all of these insects, uh, which are very high in nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and then they are pooping out um, the, um, the remains of bats. Um, when they get into nice large congregations like they do in some of these snags, that fertilizer is, is accumulating at the base of that tree. So when this snag falls down, there was a colony of bats there. Um, it's been fertilized and any seedlings that come in will be uh, fertilized will have fertilized soil for them to grow in. Um, this is a study that actually quantified that. Um, this is a cavity tree like the one I showed you before for um, the Raffinesque big-eared bat, but this is um, down in Panama. Um, and they looked at um, the seeds of trees that had bats roosting in it compared to the trees that did not have bats roosting in them. And you can see that those seeds where there were bats at higher nitrogen and phosphorus in those seeds. And the more bats in the colony, um, the higher the nitrogen. So bats are providing lots of ecological uh, services for forests. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that many bats around the world are declining. So based on um, IUCN rankings, about 23% of bats worldwide are threatened. And then about 78% um, are either declining or we just don't have enough data to know um, whether what their populations are doing. Uh, here in uh, the US, um, we have eight federally threatened or endangered taxa. That's out of 47 species of bats that we have in the US. Uh, six of those are in the Eastern United States. Uh, two of those are in the Western United States. And additionally, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service is uh, currently reviewing the status of two species, uh, the tricolored bat, the little guy on the left, and the little brown bat, the one on the right, uh, to determine whether they warrant listing under the Endangered Species Act. And we should know about that, oh, I think within the next year or so. Um, also, a number of states uh, have listed species of conservation concern. Some species, for example, South Carolina will even list some species as state endangered. Um, and so there are a number of species throughout the US that are species of concern uh, as listed by states. So um, you just need to check with particular states and their regulations. Why are bats declining? Well, for the last several, um, probably hundreds of years uh, or hundred years or so, uh, habitat loss and fragmentation has been uh, a big issue. Uh, bats are depending on forests and other natural areas uh, such as wetlands, uh, you take those away, you take away the habitat and um, it's difficult for them to survive in this 
great numbers. Loose disturbance, um, particularly historically, uh, was very important. Uh, people going into caves when bats were hibernating or into maternity colonies, um, either killing the bats or just causing so much disturbance that the bats use up their fat reserves. Um, so that has caused um, some major mortality in a number of areas. Luckily now, a number of those major hibernacula are dated uh, and protected. Other types of roosts are lost big snags, big hollow trees. Um, when we lose bottomland hardwood forests, we lose a lot of important roosts. Toxicants and pollutants, um, everything from um, pesticides to light pollution um, are affecting bats. And then over the last 20 years or so, we've had uh, two new threats uh, that have been greatly affecting bats, those being wind energy development and white nose syndrome. Wind energy development is um, impacting some of the migratory species like the hoary bat, the red bat, and the silver haired bat. And white nose syndrome, many of you may have heard about, has been impacting bats uh, since uh, the winter of 2006, 2007. Uh, this is a fungal disease uh, and introduced from Eurasia. And um, it has spread from its origin in New York, uh, clear across the country in and into uh, Canada. And as you can see, um, down to the border of Mexico. And um, I'm not gonna get into the details, but for the purposes of this talk, the important thing is that it so far has been greatly affecting uh, four species in particular. Uh, these are bats that hibernate in caves and mines uh, during the winter. Uh, Northern long-eared bat, little brown bat, tricolored bat, and Indiana bat. Indiana bat was already listed as endangered. Uh, the Northern long-eared bat um, was listed in 2015 due to losses from white nose syndrome. And as I said, little brown bat and tricolored bat are being um, examined or their status is being reviewed for listing. And as you can see here, what we are seeing is almost 100% uh, declines in many hibernacula. Um, and so uh, their populations have really been decimated by this disease. So uh, given that bats are very important for forests, forests are important for bats, and bats are declining, how do we manage forests to avoid harming bats? And on the flip side of that, how can we manage forests to foster bat conservation and recovery. And so that's actually a question that I've been trying to address for the last 20 years with my own individual research. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was asked to give a uh, presentation at the American Society of Mammalogists on this topic. And so instead of just sort of doing a, a general review, I decided that to do a qualitative synthesis of all of the research that have been conducted on uh, civicultural effects on bats. And so my objectives were to conduct this meta-analysis. Um, so not just do a review, but really analyze uh, the results of these data so that we can inform managers and policymakers and also identify pitfalls and problems of the past research so that we can do better in the future and come up with better answers, again, to inform managers and policy. So what I did was conduct a systematic review of the literature um, and, and there are now um, sort of protocols for doing a systematic review. Uh, I use Google Scholar and particularly the Web of Science I used uh, keywords, you know, bat or chiroptera, uh, along with such things as forest management, harvest, fire, clear cut, thin, and a few others. Um, and I also looked at a couple of review papers that had already been published. 
so that to make sure that I had all of the literature. And for the analysis, I limited uh, those studies that I included in this analysis to those that directly tested the effects of civil cultural treatments on bats. So for example, if a study uh, looked at uh, how bats use forests and they said, you know, they use this type of forest and they use this type of forest and this type of structure. And then they made inferences based on those results about how forest management might affect bats. I didn't include that because it was not a direct test of the civicultural or forest management treatments on bats. Um, for various reasons, I um, restricted this to insectivorous bats only and only in the temperate zone. Um, so this included Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and North America. And almost all of the studies were conducted at the stand level. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later and why that's a problem and how we need to uh, overcome that in the future and how that really um, limits to somewhat our, our management. So um, after doing uh, all this literature review and looking at a million titles and abstracts and papers, um, I came up with 88 studies that I included uh, in my synthesis. Uh, some of these looked at multiple treatments and they might look at clear cuts and fire and thinning or you know, various different um, combinations thereof. And oftentimes they use multiple methods and sometimes they looked at multiple responses. So the treatments that I found that, that people were studying uh, were clear cut or shelter wood harvest, uh, fire and mostly prescribed fire, um, partly because there were not that many wildfire studies a couple of years ago, or the step fires did not meet my criteria for fitting into uh, this, this analysis. Gap formation, uh, where they went out and created uh, small gaps anywhere from you know, a, a tenth of a hectare up to about a hectare. Uh, history of plantation forestry, and this came mostly, these studies were mostly done in Europe. Uh, regrowth forests, so that second growth forest, and then thinning. And then for each paper, um, I categorized whether they were looking at foraging responses, roosting responses, or some other uh, type of response. And for each species or group of species, I determined whether uh, the bats were responding in a negative way, uh, essentially that, uh, for example, they used a particular treatment such as um, a thinned area, significantly less than a control area. Neutral, there was no significant difference between the treated area and the control area or positive. So either they were using it more or if it was a telemetry study, they were actually selecting uh, those treated areas. And then for each species or species group, I determined whether it was a closed space, edge space or open space forager. And what this allowed me to do was to essentially um, treat uh, studies from North America, the same way I treated studies from um, Australia. They were very different, they're different species, but because they are the same guild of species, um, I could easily compare them. But what do I mean by closed space, edge space, and open space? Well, in general, if you look at a community of bats um, or assemblage of bats, what you see is that you tend to have species that are closed space foragers um, and edge space and open space. So closed space, these are bats that are usually the smallest body uh, bats in the community. They tend to have short stubby wings. Um, and so this small body size and short stubby wings um, allows them to be extremely agile. So they can zip around 
uh, in forests. Uh, they can avoid obstacles and they can pick up very small objects. Uh, they also have high frequency echolocation calls, which do not go very far, but allow them again to pick up very small objects uh, with their echolocation. And we call these bats clutter adaptive. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have the open space foragers. These are the large body bats. They have long, narrow wings. Um, and that makes them very strong flyers, but they're not particularly agile. So they're not going to be zipping around in really dense forests. And they have lower frequency echolocation calls. So these are louder calls and they are better able to pick up larger objects and not so good at picking up really small objects. The edge space foragers are those that have ecological, morphological characteristics somewhat in between. And so we often find these bats using the edges between say dense areas and open areas. And they can use basically go in between, you know, open or forest. Some examples um, for those of you familiar with our bats, uh, Close space foragers, the small footed bats, both the eastern and the western small footed bats, the long eared bats, uh, both the northern long eared bat and the western northern long eared bat, uh, Raffinesque big eared bat, Townsend big eared bat. So uh, these bats are really agile. On uh, the other end of the spectrum, uh, hoary bat, Brazilian free tail bat, big brown bat, these big strong flyers. Um, those are our open space foragers. And then species like the red bats. Uh, tricolored bat, little brown bat tend to be edge space foragers. So just a little bit about the studies uh, that have been conducted. Uh, what we see, first of all, is not a lot was done uh, before the late 90s. Um, and then since about the year 2000, we see a nice steady increase in uh, the number of studies focusing in on the effects of civiculture and forest management on bats. Um, we also see that the majority, about two thirds of the studies um, are foraging studies and a majority of those are done with acoustic detectors. And acoustic detectors are great. There, there are some problems with them, but in general, it allows you to do a real study design. So you can have you know, a, um, a randomized block design. Uh, so you can put detectors out in, in your various treatments and, and compare um, bat activity in each of those treatments at the same time. Roosting studies, about one third of the studies were roosting studies and all of those were conducted using radio telemetry, which is very labor intensive. Uh, only one study looking at uh, demographic responses of bats, and only one study looking at physiological responses of bats to subculture. So, okay, what did I find? Um, first of all, uh, looking at uh, foraging responses of closed space foragers. So, again, these are bats that like um, interior forest. Uh, so, Clear cuts and shelter wood, um, there tends to be negative uh, responses or neutral responses, not a lot of positive responses uh, to, to harvesting uh, at that level. And also we see uh, either negative or neutral responses to regrowth forest. On the other hand, uh, fire uh, seems to be prescribed fire primarily, uh, primarily neutral responses. Uh, so they didn't avoid the burned areas, they weren't attracted to the uh, burned areas. And in terms of thinning, again, we see a uh, tendency for either a neutral or a positive response to uh, thinning. When we turn to the edge space foragers, so these are bats that will use both forest and uh, open areas and like that edges in between, what we see is uh, primarily positive responses uh, to clear cut shelter woods. 
Arvis, uh, prescribed fire, gap formation, and thinning. So basically, if you open up the forest, they will come. Um, and that really isn't all that surprising. Uh, again, we see a pretty strong negative response to regrowth forests. And then going to the open space foragers, again, open up the forest and you see pretty strong positive responses um, to these treatments. So lot, you know, clear cut, you will have these open space foragers there. Prescribed fire, um, it was actually somewhat between neutral and, um, and positive. Uh, and sometimes that's a case where the prescribed fire um, might not have been uh, severe enough or there had been a time lag between the study and the fire uh, so that possibly the, uh, the area had not been opened that much. Uh, but gap formation, again, uh, create an opening and these open space foragers will use it for foraging. And thinning also um, a strong positive response. And again, do not like these re regrowth forests. Now turning to bats roosting responses and um, going back to the smaller close space foragers, um, there seems to be a pretty strong positive response uh, to prescribed fire. And this may be because you run a fire through an area, it opens it up a bit and um, A, it may create some snags for some of these bats to roost in. And uh, B, it may allow more solar radiation in on the roost. So the bats can use that solar radiation while they are roosting um, to warm, keep their body warm. And so they don't have to use endogenous energy, they can just rely on, on the sun. Um, the other uh, studies found primarily um, again, there aren't a lot, um, but tendency towards um, negative or neutral responses to clear cuts, uh, thinning, and regrowth forests. I had to combine the edge and open space foragers when looking at roosting responses because there weren't um, that many studies on these guys. Um, so just one study on prescribed fire, and that showed a positive response. So so that definitely we need a lot more information there and possibly um, a positive response to thinning. Again, we need a lot more information, but we do tend to see uh, negative responses to clear cuts, plantation forestry and regrowth forests. Uh, clear cuts and, and heavy shelter woods, there just aren't a lot of trees for them to use as roofs. Uh, plantation forests, uh, oftentimes you don't have snags in those plantation forests and you don't have uh, trees with really large canopies that most um, foliage roosting bats like. Uh, so they just probably are not providing the habitat for roosting there. Um, and regrowth forests, again, not a lot of snags um, and not a lot of large trees and very dense. So you're not getting much of that solar radiation that the bats can use for, for warming themselves. And just to summarize here, what we found, um, or what I found was that roosting behavior tends to be more sensitive to semicultural treatments than foraging behavior. Um, and, and that's not surprising because bats are far more picky about where they roost than where they forage. Um, and they have far more specific requirements when it comes to roosting. Um, and some of this may be due to loss of roost structures uh, in areas that are quite suitable for foraging. So for example, in harvested sites, in thin sites and plantations. Um, Mid-rotation treatments such as uh, thinning and prescribed fire are more likely to elicit both uh, positive foraging and roosting responses. So in this case, you're maintaining that overstory for roosting um, you may be creating um, some snags 
uh, you're reducing clutter and increasing solar radiation. Edge and open space foragers were more likely to um, have these positive responses to harvesting and thinning, and they like they like open areas and you reduce the clutter and, and they're more likely uh, to loose out of forage in those areas. Um, it may also be related to insect uh, availability, uh, particularly in terms of fire. The studies that looked at insect responses to thinning found no differences. A few studies found increases uh, insects uh, after uh, prescribed fire. And then we have the issue with regrowth forks. And so what we found is negative responses, whether it was roosting or foraging, and whether you were a big bat or a little bat. Um, they don't like these regrowth forks. They're highly cluttered, they're inefficient for foraging. Um, but um, we know that that's like these open areas. Um, so the problem is you go and you cut, uh, but 10, 20, 30 years down the line, those cut areas are going to be regrowth forests. So these areas that turn out to be good foraging areas now will turn out to be poor foraging areas uh, down the line. So this points to, again, uh, my point at the beginning is that these are scan level studies, but we need to manage at the landscape scale and over time. And so how do we make sure that there is sufficient um, open areas, there's sufficient mature forest um, and later rotation forest. Um, and obviously you have to go through that, that root growth forest, but how do we make sure that that, that is not all that is out there? Um, and so that is going to require some long-term large scale planning. And some caveats about this research. Um, that I need to talk about. Um, and that's all of the studies that have been done, including some that I have done. Um, so first of all, the majority of studies were conducted during the summer. Uh, part of that is that, you know, it's a great time to send students out to do their master's thesis. Um, but it's also an important time for bats. That's when they are uh, having their young. And so it is critical that they uh, have good habitat that during that period. But um, it's spring and fall are also periods of migration. Uh, winter, some bats are active uh, and they are torporing during part of that winter, but they're active during other parts of the winter. Um, during the spring, bats are recovering from the effects of white nose syndrome. During the fall, they are putting on fat and preparing to go back into hibernation. So all seasons are really critical. Um, so they may have different habitat needs in different seasons. Uh, the other thing is that we know that habitats change greatly uh, between summer and winter, particularly deciduous forests. Um, and so uh, forests that bats may not go anywhere near during the summer because they are too thick may be very suitable during the winter. And so we really need to see how bats are responding to these civicultural treatments year round, not just during the summer. Um, another caveat is that we assume that uh, greater activity or greater use uh, equals better habitat and therefore greater fitness. You know, the bat populations are going to go up. Uh, we don't know that. Uh, we're, again, that's an assumption. Uh, so we really need to look at some of these physiological responses and demographic responses to really understand how our management is affecting them. Uh, this is an example from the tropical store, uh, forest uh, where they measured leukocyte numbers, uh, which are important for immune function. And bats in actively logged forests have lower leukocytes than those in recovering forests. So they may have some subtle differences that we're not picking up with our measures of activity or foraging or roosting. And as I mentioned, how do we uh, translate stand level responses uh, to forest level responses over uh, and over long periods of time? So how can we come up with good 
using the data that we have to come up with good long-term large-scale forest management uh, plans. So just a few recommendations. Um, we need to examine responses throughout the year, examine demographic and physiological responses, model stand level responses across landscape and over time, and also um, foster even more of these mid-rotation treatments that will improve forest health as well as bat habitat. And now very briefly, just turn to um, this review that Rachel and I have uh, completed. It's in our review uh, with the Journal of Fire Ecology. So hopefully it will be out by uh, the end of the year. Um, but we were interested to know, um, again, there's been a lot of research very recently on wildfire and ask the question, do bats respond in the same way to wildfire as they do to prescribed fire? Um, and so basically, that's also sort of a corollary of that is if that's the case, you know, then we can use results from prescribed fire to predict how bats might respond to wildfire and vice versa. So just uh, to remind you of bats responses primarily to prescribed fire. We see in terms of um, foraging, they're responding primarily in a positive or a neutral way for both foraging and roosting to prescribed fire. But this may not do that to wildfire. Um, and just a few differences between the two, the scale is very different. So prescribed fires are mostly on the scale of hundreds to thousands of hectares, whereas wildfires, particularly recently, are on the scale of thousands to hundreds of thousands or even more hectares. Uh, prescribed fire may be variable severity, but in general, most prescribed fires are, um, are mostly low to medium severity uh, fires. Whereas wildfires, again, you can have a lot of variability in there, but we are seeing again more and more these greater, higher severity burns. And the other thing with prescribed fire is that we can control the ignition time. Um, so we can control the date of the um, when we set that fire so that we don't set it in the middle of uh, a sensitive species reproductive period. Or we can time it uh, during the day. The bats will go into torpor during winter uh, and spring um, and their body temperature is low and they're a lot slower to respond to fire cues like the sound of fire, fire or the smell of fire. So the later in the day that you set that prescribed fire, the more likely bats are to respond and leave their roost and fly away. Um, with uh, wildfire, we have no control uh, either with the date or the time of day that that fire goes through an area. So um, those are important things to consider. In our review, we covered uh, all of these questions. I'm not going to touch on these now, um, but hopefully, as I say, you can read this in a couple of months. Um, when we did a similar literature review, um, and it was a, a true review, it was not a meta-analysis. Um, we found 49 papers and three theses, and it was pretty well split between uh, prescribed fire and wildfire. And um, we did this globally, and, uh, but you can see that the majority of studies have, been co have come from Australia uh, and North America. And, Australia, you've got a nice split between prescribed fire studies and wildfire studies. Uh, North America, we have a split personality here. Um, 25 studies have looked at prescribed fire responses or responses of bats to prescribed fire. Only one study looked at wildfire. And out west, um, only one, no studies have looked at responses of bats to prescribed fire but there have been several, particularly recently, that have looked at the responses of bats to wildfire. Uh, so, so that's uh, an 
important dichotomy. And again, we have this nice increase in uh, research looking at responses of bats to both wildfire and prescribed fire. And as I mentioned, over the last year, a bunch of papers have come out. So we were writing the review and just papers were coming in as we were writing. So it was a little hard. Um, so just a, a real brief summary, um, adding to my database from, from the previous study, um, we still find that there are primarily positive or neutral foraging responses to prescribed fire and positive roosting responses to prescribed fire. We see more, not huge number, but, but definitely more negative foraging responses to wildfire. Um, and these are from studies um, primarily in um, Western North America and Australia. And only two studies um, that actually even looked at roosting responses to wildfire. And they had conflicting results and it was the same species. So obviously we need a lot more information on roosting responses of bats to wildfire uh, as well as prescribed fire. And we also need a lot more information on how both prescribed fire and wildfire are affecting roost characteristics, uh, particularly snag characteristics, for example, how much bark is left. Um, which is an important characteristic for a number of species. Uh, time since last burn is, appears to be a very important uh, parameter to look at when you are assessing uh, bats responses to uh, both prescribed fire and wildfire. This is just one example here. This was a wildfire that went through Southern Italy. Uh, it went through in 2017. They had been studying uh, a particular species of bats uh, beforehand. Uh, and the, the gray bars are the percentage of females that are reproductive. And you can see that the year after the fire, 2018, there was a significant decline in the number of females or the proportion of females that were in reproductive condition. But two years after the fire, they had rebounded. So there may be some resilience here in the system. And so uh, considering time since last burn is really critical. Uh, fire severity, we found this for both uh, prescribed fires, for some studies that looked at prescribed fire severity, uh, as well as wildfire severity, that the closed space forests of small bats that like interior forests uh, appear to not like uh, high severity burns. And so um, that is something that we need to be concerned about, particularly as there are more and more wild, high severity wildfires out there. Um, also an important concept that we need to consider in future studies, people are just starting to ask this question, does pyrodiversity beget biodiversity? That question's been around for a while, but it's now uh, people are looking at that in terms of bats. Uh, what we see is that some bats respond positively uh, to pyrodiversity, while as other species uh, do not. Uh, so this is something that we need to start looking at, um, and again, at a landscape scale. Uh, so for future studies of prescribed fire and wildfire, um, we need to consider both scale um, spatial scale, so looking at that uh, pyrodiversity across um, on a large scale as well as the small scale and the temporal uh, responses of bats. Uh, do they recover after a few years? And climate change effects are very important. Uh, they uh, seem to be leading to increased wildfire um, because of hotter days um, and shorter uh, prescribed fire seasons, uh, there are decreasing number of days that you can do a prescribed burn, and also uh, interactions with other stressors. So when you've got drought on top of fire, uh, or that's leading to fire, but drought already is impacting bats because, as I said, they require water, particularly for reproduction. So you've got a drought, and then you add on a fire, um, 
what, where is that tipping point? So with that, I would be very happy to take any uh, questions that you have. Great. And then that was that was interesting and really interesting. Um, yeah, and if folks have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. I do have one that came in kind of from early on. Um, and it was, what about wind energy development is detrimental to bat populations? Is the amount of open space needed or something else? Uh, bats are actually flying into the turbines and are being killed by the turbines. And it's been estimated anywhere from, yeah, there are lots of estimates out there. It's, it's hard to get a good uh, handle on it, um, but between say about 600 to 800,000 bats per year that are being killed um, by these wind turbines is primarily the migratory species. Um, it's don't quite know why, um, they seem to be attracted to the turbines for some reason. Um, yeah, um, it, it's very interesting um, in terms of their behavior. Um, there are ways to mitigate uh, the mortality. Uh, one is to feather uh, the turbines so that they're going parallel to the wind um, on low wind nights, because most of the mortality occurs uh, when it's when it's low wind. So if the companies will will feather their turbines during those low wind periods when they're not generating that much energy, um, that will decrease the mortality. The problem is that they're now getting bigger and bigger and bigger turbines that can now generate electricity at lower wind speeds. So um, we'll just We'll have to see. Uh, people are also working on acoustic deterrence to keep bats away. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, yeah. So, if anyone else has any questions, please type them into the chat box. If not, um, we have one oh, from Sharon. Ooh, they're coming fast now. <laughs> Sharon says, Shelter woods and clear cuts can be very different in terms of the number of large trees retained after the cut. Would that play a role in the response of that? It does. Um, and actually a study that um, when my graduate student stayed up on the Nanahala National Forest, uh, he was looking, he looked at um, sizes of openings um, of cuts up there. They were mostly shelter woods. And um, he did find that the more trees left in, um, in the, the cut, uh, the greater bad activity he, he found. Yep. Interesting. Thank you. And then the next question from David is, have you witnessed or are there studies of bats being killed during summer prescribed fires on oak pine forest and plot? of less than three hectares. And he says, different things, the location is on Cape Cod. So I'm guessing he's thinking of a specific spot. <laughs> um, so one of the things, we have no estimates of mortality of bats during fires. Um, and, and if anybody knows a good way to estimate that, um, so we don't have that, and that is something that we pointed out in our review is that we don't have um, estimates of mortality. Um, during the summer, bats, um, they might go into torpor, um, but it's probably um, not as deep as it will during the winter. So they're likely to respond. Uh, so a couple of lab studies have shown that bats do respond to the smell and the sound of approaching fire. So um, and a study that recently came out down in Florida during the winter was that, um, and, and also a study that was done in Kentucky, was that, um, you know, they set a fire with a bit of 20 meters of a roost. And these were during late, well, early spring and late spring, and the bats flew away. So they they smell it, they hear it, 
um, and they will fly away. Um, you know, if you've got a fast approaching wildfire, I don't know. And that's, again, the difference between a prescribed fire and a wildfire. Um, so in terms of mortality, and, and people tend to avoid summer reproductive period, uh, the females can take the young with them. Um, so if a fire comes through and, and they've got young, um, they can carry the young. But, um, you know, if, it's, if they're large young and they're not flying, it may be, you know, difficult. Um, and if the young are just learning to fly, then that may also be a, a pretty vulnerable period. But, um, yeah, I wish we had some good numbers on, on mortality. And particularly, I mentioned these bats roosting in the litter during the winter. And, um, and that is another concern. Um, and, and that's why it's suggested that if people can do it later in the day and hopefully the bats will, will arouse and fly out. And a number of fire managers have, you know, I'll say, you know, we set a fire here and hey, we saw bats flying up out of the ground. So, um, and that's actually how we first learned that, that bats were, were using those areas for roosting. Yeah, that makes sense. That would be an interesting sight to see. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we have a question from Amanda. Are there mitigation measures that can be implemented during regeneration harvest that would minimize the negative impacts on bat species that prefer closed canopies? So retention patches, for example. Yeah, um, certainly. Um, and leaving snags. Um, leaving patches of snags. So oftentimes what you find um, when bats will use snags, they like areas that have several snags um, together. And that allows them, you know, if they're disturbed, they can move um, from one roost to another. So leaving patches of snags is, is a good um, way to, to mitigate some of those, those issues. And also some cover, you don't want um, a roost, you know, again, depending on where you are, um, but you don't want it completely exposed um, necessarily to the sun. Um, and having some areas of shade uh, will also help. And again, um, we're dealing with warmer and warmer climates. And so some of our, um, some of what we're learning or we've learned over the last 20 years um, in years like this year out west, um, bats may be doing very different things um, when you've got 110 degree days in Oregon. Um, they may be doing very different things than they did uh, under a normal year. So we sort of have to prepare for both for those weather extremes because we're seeing more and more of those. Great, thank you, Susan. So we are at two o'clock, top of the hour. And so we are out of time, but that being said, I am going to put the link to the SAS CFE credits form in the chat box. So if you would like to get credit for today, please click on that and fill it out and I will get you a certification and also send that info to SAS. And yes, that this is being recorded and it will be made available um, on the Guild's YouTube channel. And I will send that out to everybody that's attended today as well as everyone that's registered. So you'll be able to watch it as many times as you want. Um, <laughs> and anybody so, is you. free to contact me with questions via email. If you want to put my email in the chat. Yep, I can do that right now. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. And thank you again, Susan, so much. That was a great presentation. And you have a lot of knowledge stored in your brain about this. And I've, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me.